Information about the world of running, inspiration to fuel passion and excellence, and ideas for making connections and finding community. You're listening to A to Z Running. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the A to Z Running Podcast, where we help runners thrive. I'm Andy. And I am Zach. And this week, we are broadcasting from Dallas, Texas, hence the change in scenery and sound for anyone who's paying that close of attention. But we're still on our regularly scheduled programming, and we had the privilege of interviewing two-time U.S. champion Natasha Rogers about starting from scratch. So if you've ever been in that situation yourself where you just have to start over for whatever reason, this is an excellent conversation for that among many other scenarios and stick around afterward for the world of running segment as well where we discuss recent news from the berlin marathon an article about marathon fueling and a glimpse at a pro marathoner's training plans it's always interesting when we get a, an acute look at something a train training plan a marathon runner is doing so we've got that for you coming at the end of the episode. Now be sure at this point you always begin by going to a to z running.com, click the word follow, and it's right next to the word coaching, which is not a bad place to click and <laughs> br- browse or peruse as well. Also, we're on YouTube and all the social media places and podcast apps like Apple and Google, and you can find us A to Z running in all of those locations. We have had the opportunity to connect with other content creators, one of them being Chelsea of May's Menu, who makes amazing recipes with runners in mind. And I had the opportunity to collaborate with her because I had created this bread recipe and I am not someone who develops recipes. So she took that and she made it better. We should probably caveat that and say, Andy doesn't develop recipes that are then sold to other people online. Yeah. She certainly well, develops lots of this. recipes. It's for free. So anyway, lots. all of you guys can go and taste this amazing recipe that Chelsea made even better. You can go to May's menu and look for healthy cinnamon apple bread. You could also go to a to z running.com slash episode 104 for the link as well. So thank you to Chelsea for making amazing recipes for runners as we train, as we live life and want to enjoy food too. Well, speaking of enjoying life, one of the things that always helps a runner enjoy life more are the recovery resources available to you. Roof Tree. You've heard us talking about Roof Tree because they are our sponsor. Thank you to Roof Tree Health. They make an amazing elite massage gun that we've been using and we took it with us to Dallas, Texas. And I want to mention that you can take it through as a carry on. So, just a note for all of you runners out there that want to bring recovery tools, you can bring it in as a carry-on. It probably helps to not use the word gun when you're describing <laughs> it, though. Like call it a, an, a massage apparatus, tool? perhaps. It's a massage tool. Uh, even tool. I, just avoid those kinds of words. <laughs> yeah. Massage apparatus. So make sure you take it out of your bag as you would any other large electronic device. Open it up, unzip it. You don't want to like keep it in your bag. You'll get searched. And <laughs> proceed sure. to answer all the awkward questions from both security and the people around you when they start looking at it and thinking, what, what is, this? is yeah. that? And then when you describe what it is, of and course, they're going to ask you, what do you do with that? And you could give and them <laughs> these descriptors, which is relieve muscle pain, soreness, and stiffness, promote blood circulation, improve range of motion, and accelerate warm-up and recovery. That is Roof Tree Elite Massage Gun. We love it. And everyone at TSA does now as well. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And now on... Rooftrees.com. That is R O O F T R E E S dot com to check it out for yourself. And you can also find it on Amazon. All right, let's get on to the main topic. Multiple time U.S. champion Natasha Rogers knows what it's like to start again from scratch. Rogers has been generous in sharing her journey, her running career with a couple major restarts. Because we wanted to get at this very specific topic of restarting, we don't get into all of Natasha's amazing story. To hear more about her life and sport, I recommend listening to her conversation with her sister on the podcast Reflex. That's R E E F L E X. So briefly, Natasha is the 2012 NCAA 
10,000 meter champion. In that same season, Natasha was the US Olympic trials runner up in the 10,000 meters, despite having a fall during the race. And because she was just shy of the world Olympic standard, Natasha did not get to compete at the Olympic games. And instead she, of pursuing an immediate running career, she spent her final college semester studying abroad before signing her first pro contract. In 2017, Natasha quickly rose to one of the best in the country, winning the USATF Half Marathon Championships and two other road racing championships she podiumed in that year. In early 2018, her world was rocked when she hurt her knee out of nowhere, had a surgery that went wrong, and she had to withdraw from the IAAF World Half Marathon Championships where she was scheduled to run for Team USA. This is where Natasha had to start from scratch. You'll hear more about that in the interview, but I don't. I do want to mention that when she returned, when she joined with Hans, Hansen's Brooks Editions project, she quickly rose again to be runner-up at the 15K Championships, and she was the champion of the 2020 USA Cross Country Championships. In this episode, we discuss with Natasha the return physically, rediscovery of identity, and the return to the sport of running. Let's talk to Natasha. Natasha, welcome to the A to Z Running Podcast. We're so excited to have you in your fall busy season just beginning. We appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to do this. (laughs) Yeah, well, we've been listening to your story following along since 2012, and your journey has been one that is heroic. And many of us see your story and we see how you have overcome so many things. And that's why we want to have you on the show today to talk about coming back from pretty much scratch. And I shared with the, uh, the audience right before having you on some of your journey. So let's just dive right in. Natasha. Right, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. Let's get into it. Can you talk to me about how you in 2018 were able to physically come back to running from scratch? So it was a very slow and gradual process. Um, I had to be very mindful. Um, I had to listen to my body and not my mind. Um, My mind wanted me to, you know, get back out there on the paths and the streets and the parks and go for hours. Um, I was, you know, I missed it. I missed it really bad. Um, I was super sad and depressed without it. Um, But you have to keep that at bay and you have to um, keep yourself in check and um, just go slow and like um, take it all in and um, appreciate going slow because um, once it starts clicking again, you're going to be, you know, (laughs) somewhat dreading those tough hard workouts um, as we tend to do. Um, but it's like a love hate relationship, you know, how it goes. (laughs) Um, but yeah, it's just really, really taking your time with it. Um, because your body, it it forgets a little bit. And if you jump back in too quick, you're just going to start at zero again, because another injury will pop up or something. Um, so I'm just going super slow and, uh, listening to your body. Oh, that's such great advice. We can all listen to that advice and heed that because we do want to rush back to what we love. And it is so wonderful to run on on our favorite path for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, three hours when we're marathon training. And that love, that passion can sometimes blind us from what we need to get to do what we love. So can you tell us a little bit about what that actually was for you? Like, how did you start? How much did you do? What were some of the extracurriculars, so to speak, when it comes to rehabbing? So I really had to address um, my weaknesses and what contributed to getting to that low point to begin with. Um, So I had a routine, um, Myrtle, don't ever underestimate the Myrtle routine, um, band work. So supplementing 
all of that in um, was super important for me because I didn't really do that um, before the big injury happened. Um, and then when, as for the running part, um, you know, is your very basic, you know, start with a run walk program for a week or so. Uh, actually for me, uh, I'm, I'm really bad at following things by textbook. So I would just get out there, <clears throat> go very slow, listen to my body and stop. Like when you're, when you're first getting back into it, it doesn't matter. Like getting in the exact like numbers or whatever, like get that all out of your head. Like, it's just about getting back out there and going slow. Um, but yeah, at the very beginning, I did like a run walk thing. And then um, I would do like 30 minutes. And then I did that for like a couple weeks. And then um, also using cross training a lot um, because people, I don't know if people underestimate cross training, but for some reason, runners don't want to do it but it's so powerful and it actually uh, helps your core strength and um, works on other weaknesses and um, like getting in the pool and aqua jogging. That is the best thing you can do for yourself um, as a runner, especially if you're injury prone. Um, I, even when I'm perfectly healthy, I'm in the pool three times a week at least. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of that, uh, um, especially at the beginning of like coming back um, from the injury. Oh, that is great. We actually just spoke about aqua jogging and like dug into some research with that. So I appreciate you sharing that you do it and then also encouraging us to continue to do it. I, I get not wanting to do the cross training because it's really like I would just want to run. But also when we look long term and we want to develop ourselves as athletes, we really do have to do some of the things we don't love as much to be able to perform the way we want to. So that was great advice. Thank you for that. And then I also wanted to know at that point when you're when you're beginning doing the run walk, where was your mind at with running as a sport? Um, I really had to like, just totally suppress that for a while. Um, if anything, I would just kind of let myself dream about like the future and, um, kind of manifest, but like, as far as like the present moment, when I was coming back, it was like, I can't think about getting all hasty and like competing right now. Like that's just that's being like too tough on yourself and that's being unrealistic. So we don't want to do that. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely don't want to get hasty with it. So I kind of suppressed that part of me and that's a huge part of me. Um, and it was, it was a challenge, but I was just happy to be back out there. Like I was just happy to be able to move my legs and um, like go for a very slow jog because I, I couldn't walk for about a year and, um, that, you know, when I wasn't able to walk for a year, it was like, I wasn't, it wasn't the racing that I missed so much. It was just like the actual, like going for a jog part that I missed the most. It was like, God, I wish I could do that. Like, I just, I, that's such a blessing. Um, and so just trying to appreciate like the small joys and um, being present. Hmm. Yeah, that's such great advice. So in that time, you said you, you let yourself dream a little. How was your relationship with running? Did it did it grow? Was it was it better because you had to discover the another part of running besides the competition? Can you talk us through a little bit of that? Yeah, it was better. Um, and once I like regained full health and was able to start actually training again, I was a better athlete all around. Um, just because I had this newfound appreciation for 
just being able to do it. Um, and after overcoming so much hardship and like literally pain and suffering. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it really, you learn a lot and just with it, like anything in life running aside, um, like really good things can come out of like those dark places. You learn a lot and you have to be able to like, look at it that way or else you're just a victim in your own life. And, um, it took a, a good long time <laughs> for me to be able to get to that point because initially I did feel like a victim and, um, I kind of let myself just, uh, <laughs> go to some really dark places, but, um, shifting that mindset first and then like everything else kind of follows like pretty pretty miraculously if you if you can shift your mindset like that hmm. yeah and I admire so much how you've done that because it has not been easy for you it has not it I mean in 2012 it was heartbreaking. You know, it was a really difficult thing because you did everything right and had hard things happen. So when something like that back in 2012 at the Olympic trials and you run an amazing race and you have that fall and you still are, you're still the silver medalist at the Olympic trials. How do you reconcile yourself with the sport at that time and then come out you know, now I'm talking to you, Natasha, and you have such a healthy mindset. What was the journey with your identity, with your relationship with running uh, in general, and then also as a sport? I know that's kind of a big question, but would you walk us through that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, having an identity crisis was the best thing that could have ever happened for me. Um, it ties into some really deep stuff. I'm going to go deep for a second here. Um, but every human, we all collectively suffer with the ego. Um, and the ego is, is what causes a lot of unhappiness. So the ego likes to identify with things. And um, it wasn't healthy for me to ever completely identify with running or this Olympian title. Um, and so, you know, yeah, I, in 2012, I got kind of <laughs> the bad end of the stick there. And then, um, yeah, I did have this like chip on my shoulder for years and years for a decade after. And even up to this most recent Olympic trials, I, I still had that chip on my shoulder and it it honestly may have hindered me quite a bit um I like you know I put way too much pressure on myself to fulfill this dream and this title and um that was the ego trying to identify with that and trying to hold on to the past and um really like we shouldn't be holding on to anything in the past. Um, it is, it makes us who we are, but to cling on to it is not healthy. And um, neither is, you know, clinging on to the future either. So uh, just being present and uh, making the most of that, the present. Um, yeah, I've learned so much on this journey and it's been really beautiful. Um, like I, this past trials, um, it, it was really tough for me because I didn't make it. And it, it was a really hard feat to accomplish, um, especially with the, the field that I was up against this year. Um, I nearly killed myself trying to make it happen in the past eight months. And um, yeah, it's just, I'm not going to take that approach ever again because um, there's repercussions to, to that. <laughs> mm. So, yeah, learned a lot. The most beautiful thing about all of this is um, the people who have supported me and seeing them in the stands and 
um, inspiring other people, um, even through the failure. Uh, I think a lot of people look at me, look to me for not so much like the t the accolades or the title that I have, but the resiliency and um, you know picking myself up after failure. Hmm. Which is what I see as the biggest success. So you have titles, but you also have this very, very inspiring story. And no matter where you go with it, Natasha, the fact that you continue to rise up again and have this mindset that you're sharing, you share your mantras, you share your your visions. And I think it's such a refreshing thing to see that because a lot of us are very driven and goal oriented. And when you were talking about not chasing something that was the past, it makes me think of like my own journey and chasing what I call the phantom ponytail. This this girl who I was, but also who I wanted to be again in this phantom ponytail, but she doesn't mm -hmm. exist. I exist. And yeah. I feel that when I look at your story, I'm able to see such strength and I really appreciate that because it's not easy to shake her. <laughs> it's not easy to shake that girl. So how how have you wrestled with that? Uh, it's an ongoing battle. <laughs> um, I tend to try to replicate um, things that I did in the past that worked and then I find that they no longer work or like, I just don't have that sort of energy anymore. Um, or just, yeah, like you change so much, you evolve and you transform. And um, I'm not that 21 year old girl who showed up to the Olympic trials and beat Shalane Flanagan. Like I, <laughs> without even knowing that I could do that, like I had this innocence back then um, and this, like fire, but that looks different for me now. Like I am not innocent in the sport anymore. I'm a veteran and I've been weathered down. Um, and almost like I have a lot of scars, like mentally. Um, and you're, we're seeing this with a lot of other pro runners who are still in the game right now. Like, um, you take like, some steeplechasers who take a big fall and they can't seem to hurdle anymore because they're scared and they, it's a scar that they really struggle to get past. Um, and similarly with me, like um, I used to be so gutsy and like I would make a move whenever I felt like it. And now I just, I have a hard time being that same com competitor. So I actually am trying to channel my younger self a little bit, um, the good parts, but with like where I'm at today, um, but also not hold myself up to like that same exact standard either. So it, it's really tough. It's, it's not easy, um, but yeah, I think it's just kind of finding a balance and not being too hard on yourself. Mm. Yeah, balance. Ooh, <laughs> that's always such a tricky one. Because at times it's like the the balance is not as clear as what we'd think, right? Because sometimes we have to focus more on one thing than another. But in all of this, and what I think I'm getting from you is we have to keep like that mental balance, that harmony, that peace, being present, as you say, and allowing for these experiences to, to be joyful. Like I, I think I heard you say a quote and maybe I'll correct me if I'm wrong a live uh live life like you already have the thing you want yes that I right? love that one yeah <laughs> so if you would can you reflect on that that quote yeah so that kind of ties into manifestation um you're not going to accomplish or obtain anything if you don't actually believe that you can have that um and like it's a really challenging thing to do um but 
it's actually extremely powerful. Um, and once you see that you can manifest, like once you see one of your manifestations occur in life, like you'll be able to do it again and again and again. Um, and so I've really like played around with that. Um, it takes being, you know, a little bit spiritual and just a lot of mental energy. Um, this past year, I, I, I really struggled this summer um, because I was living life like I would become an Olympian this, this past year. And then it didn't happen. Um, but that's not to say that it doesn't work. Like it's still, I think there was something in the back of my mind that was like, you're not going to be able to do it this year. And, or maybe, you know, just sometimes things, dreams don't come true and that's okay. Um, I'm still processing all of this because I believed in that manifestation so much. And, um, that was the thing that stung the most this year, but I, you know, so many more profound things came out of actually not making it. Um, and it, it's hard to explain that, um, unless you've kind of lived it, but I still really do believe that you should live like you already have what it is that you want um, or else what are you doing any of this for? <laughs> like, <laughs> like you have to believe that you can accomplish the things that you want or have the things that you want. And sometimes it happens, sometimes it miraculously happens and then sometimes it doesn't. And um, there's other things that happen in place of that, that are just as special. Mm -hmm. um, it may not look, like you thought it would exactly, but it's, it could surprise you. Mm. Yeah. That's really great stuff. So for those that are listening right now that are coming back from scratch, or maybe it's a new season for them, they've taken some time off or they haven't been consistent um, with their training and, and they do have goals and they are wanting things from the sport of running, from running as a lifestyle. What things would you say to them to encourage them today? Don't underestimate yourself. Um, set a really high bar for yourself, but do it in a way that is gentle and realistic. Um, I think that a lot of people feel defeated before they even start, and then they kind of try to fake it. And like, it's just this daily faking. <laughs> um, and that makes training miserable, and that makes it unbearable. But I would say let allow yourself to kind of dream big and um, do that in a way that is realistic and obtainable, but also enjoyable. Um, if you're, this is one thing that like one of the bigger things that I took out of this past year is I was literally killing myself. Um, I was so hard on myself. I, I had more mental strain than physical strain, which is saying a lot because I'm a professional elite distance runner in America. <laughs> um, and that mental strain hindered me a lot. So keeping that in check and you'll be surprised that the physical part of it gets a lot easier. Um, if you're just like, straining a little bit less mentally. Um, but yeah, don't underestimate yourself. Um, put yourself out there. Don't be discouraged through failure. Um, failure is actually a super powerful thing and it usually precedes big successes. So yeah, just get out there and um, enjoy moving your legs because some people can't do that. And it's a, it's a huge blessing. Hmm. Thank you, Natasha. You have been just such 
an amazing inspiration for me, for our listeners, and we'll continue to update our audience on your racing. And it's going to be exciting because we might be able to get a chance to to be in the same race, you and I, maybe at the 25K. Yes. <laughs> so that will be really fun to connect there. And of course, they can follow you at Natasha underscore Rogers on Instagram. Anywhere else? Um, I have a YouTube channel. It's just Natasha Rogers. I haven't done anything with it for like two months, but I'm probably going to post something in the next couple of days. But yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I hope this helps your following. And it was really nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thanks, Natasha. Thank you, Natasha, for your candor, sharing with us your journey starting from scratch. I found it extremely encouraging that someone like Natasha, you know, best in the country, can do the run walk to start again, does the myrtle, does the cross training and aqua jogging to get stronger. She's not skipping those steps. Neither should we. I thought that was very encouraging. Yeah, and the thing about it is you we always feel like we should be doing more, mm -hmm. especially when we're like coming back from a serious dearth. And the reality of that is always that we can never do more than what we can do. And in doing so, when we when we try to force things like, you know, come back too quickly, too soon, too much, all that kind of stuff, uh, we almost always end up with the opposite result and setting ourselves further back. Mm -hmm. So it's a good reminder to all of us that, you know, when, when someone at the top of the game mm -hmm. is willing to take the time, so should the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really great. And with that, let's go ahead and wrap things up with the world of running. First up in the world of running segment here, number one on the list is the Berlin Marathon. Because, as it were, the first marathon major of 2021, which is a rare thing to say in September of that year, and the first of many in a series here upcoming mm -hmm. as well. So this is reported by Let's Run.com, and we've got some really interesting things going on with this one in particular, largely because Kenanisa Bekele announced that he was going to be attempting the world record, which if you know, first of all, Elliot Kipchoge set the world record in the Berlin Marathon several years ago. And then in 2019, only two years ago, Kennedy Bekele made a run at that record and missed it only by two seconds. Mm. So when he announced <laughs> he's going again, people were like, okay. I, a, I find it so exciting. Yep, yeah, There's a chance. And they did not disappoint. They went out on world record pace. In fact, a little bit under what they intended to for world record pace. And it was no joke, so much so that only three of some of the world's best marathoners were even in the race at halfway. What was the time for halfway? Okay, so they came through the half in 60.48. Oh, nasty. One hour and 48 seconds. Okay. Yep, for half marathon, half of their full marathon, um, and intending to hold that pace. That means, for extra context here, they came through 5K in 14.22, and the first several of their 5Ks were in the 14.20s. And they came through 10K in 28.47, you know, continue to do I the love math. hearing the perspective because like, oh, you yeah. know, it's fast, but then you hear each of those splits and think, holy cow, a whole new level of respect. It was fast. In yep. fact, it was the fastest first half split in a marathon ever. Okay. Faster than Elliot Kipchoge's world record. I guess you have record. to do that when you're going for a yep. world record. Yeah. And for note, when Bekele missed the record previously, he went through the half in 61.05. Okay. And then negative split a bit in his second half. Kipchoge did something very similar when he set the world record. So this time they tried the other dynamic, which was to go at basically right. at record yeah. pace. Well, it didn't work out. Oh, bummer. <laughs> Not even close, in fact. So this is interesting. Um, clearly, you know, these guys are good marathoners. And the marathon won this time around okay. because those three, the fastest second half by any of those three was barely under 65 minutes. Oh. Massive positive okay, split. Yeah. And you know that was That's not painful. feeling good. No, that was, that was rough. As that a matter of fact, rough. they just continued to slow down the entire race. The price that. of being brave and going out at world record base oh. right there. Steep price. But even then, 
to pay that high a price, one of those three did still win the okay. race. So it was kind of one of those things where everyone paid. Yeah, them. everyone paid a price in that race going out fast. And it was Gaia Adola of Ethiopia who won the race. And he's actually relatively new on the marathon major okay. scene. He's run one other uh, strong performance, uh, and he was second to Kipchoge in a race where he ran 203 and change. So that's good. Um, this time he won the Berlin Marathon in 205.45. Okay. And that marks the slowest victory time at Berlin since 2009 in 12 years. With some of the fastest guys, but... With some really fast... A yeah. really rough race so, so dynamic. So you do the math here. They went out in the fastest half ever and ran the slowest Berlin marathon <laughs> win. That That's painful. It is. Yeah. But Bekele did, by the way, still finish third. Okay. So this isn't one of those scenarios where it's like as soon as he didn't have it anymore, he just dropped out. Bekele doesn't really do that very often, yeah. in fact. Well, he's doub- He's doubling. He's doubling. He's doing another marathon this fall. So that's good. (laughs) Yeah, we'll see if he's going to go for it again. Maybe he knew he wasn't going to have it at some point and then just kind of backed off. I don't know. I don't think so. I'd love to know. Everyone was struggling. That's true. I mean, how can you feel good after that half? Yeah. Well, similar story in the women's race, as it were. It sounds like basically just everything was fast from the line. Um, But maybe, so weather may have been a factor. It was like 60s at the start, maybe up to 70s by the end of the race, which is warm for a marathon. Mm. Humidity was up to 80% by the end, which is warm for a marathon. So that could be it. But in the women's race, they were pretty quick in the half and then slowed a bit in the second half, although not as much. Um, And as it were, only four women were in the race at half marathon. Okay. And it wasn't quite as breakneck speed as the men's race. So it just tells you what the conditions were doing to the runners. But by 35K, it was Ethiopia's Gotti Tom Gebersalesi, who was all alone for the last 7K. And by the way, in her debut marathon. All of these amazing distance runners. There's so many strong female runners right now. So many. So she did. She went on to win her debut marathon at the Berlin Marathon in a 2.20.09. That is a great debut. That's the fact. Now, Andy found a nice little tidbit for us to just make even more interesting, a relatively fascinating experience. And that was Shailene Flanagan's. Yeah, Shailene, yeah. She's no longer professional running, but can still bust out a 238. Okay, what? 238. She had announced that she's going to run all the majors within the major time frame, which is 42 days. Now, we do know that Ooh. Tokyo is canceled, but she will run another marathon in the stead of that race. Why? Yeah, because <laughs> she's just, this is this is what she wants to do to challenge herself, you know? Yeah, but it was she's supposed to be about the marathons, not ever. the majors, not just any marathon. Well, she's okay. t- seizing her opportunity. Yeah. I totally respect this, and I think it's awesome. But I have no respect for this. I'm no, kidding, I'm kidding. Oh, okay, I was like, dude. <laughs> Although I must say, I think most of the time when people announce that they're doing things like this, I think maybe that's not a wise choice. Really? But if you want to go for well, it, go for it. You know, she's, yeah, I th- she's looking for a new challenge. Anyway, <laughs> so she had said that she wants to run them all under three hours and okay. two, I mean, 238, well, she crushed that. I need to let Shailene know that her goal was not an average time of under three hours. Oh, maybe it was. I so don't know. <laughs> this, no, it was just each one under okay. three hours. So this 238 is not banking you time for the future. <laughs> just, uh, you know, post-mortem reflection here for her. Oh, gosh. She definitely is listening to the podcast. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, We're she's running Shannon. next she's week in London, so we'll see how she week. feels. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun to hear what she has to say about that. Yeah, we'll see. So number two on the list is an article about marathon nutrition. This one posted uh, from Women's Running on womensrunning.com. And no, not specifically about women's marathon nutrition. This is just general marathon nutrition for anyone. Uh, But uh, not a lot of surprises in the article. It's this kind of stuff that we're familiar with from recent research and some of the best practices. Things like, you know, how much... Uh, based off your body weight and your amount of sweating and things, how much do you need to take in during a race? What kinds of pre-race uh, volumes of nutrition and what types of nutrition do you need? All that kind of stuff. Um, and, and, and you know, basically good reminders all across the board. What's good for uh, recovery afterward? So like the ratio of carbs to protein mm-hmm. and those kinds of things. Now, if you're familiar with all of that, you're going to read the article and think, okay, good reminders. I need to keep thinking about these things. That's good. But we do still think that there's something missing from their take, which we are more privy to recently because it's not quite as well-researched a concept, but it should be, um, which is how our body absorbs nutrition. And so the nature of the kinds of things inside any given consumed item 
absorbs in different kinds of ways. And so we're very curious about this. We've been doing a little bit of background here too, but our our introduction to the concept was from Stacy Sims' book, Roar, yeah. which many of you are familiar with because you told us to read it. Yeah. And um, so good to follow up by reading her book if you want a little bit more in-depth on some of these kinds of things. But I'm just always very curious, you know, what are some of the things that we aren't fully aware of yet mm. in race day nutrition and how mm-hmm. can we maximize that? Yeah, you've done all the work. Might as well maximize it by having great fuel. Okay, and Andy, you're going to love this one for number three on the list of glimpse at a pro marathoner's training because we always like it when we find a very specific yeah. example of something. So Podium Runner published an article we just love Podium recently. Runner, by the we way. <laughs> yeah, it's a great resource on news as well as like tips on training and things like that. Yeah. Well, this one's great. So it's Jared Ward who helped publish the article for them, and he was giving a look into – uh, a week of training, just this current month, in fact, a week of training that he's doing leading up to the 2021 New York City Marathon. Okay. And it's interesting. It's fascinating. What exact workouts is he doing? It even gets to the detail of like he had to cut a workout short or rather he couldn't run the cool down. He still did the whole workout, but he couldn't run the cool down because he had to go coach his five-year-old soccer game. Wow. So if you're curious of the life. detail, yeah, like it's good stuff. Um, I, I am just always fascinated. So Jared Ward, by the way, the 2016 Olympic marathon, uh, sixth place finisher. So certainly got some accolades behind him as well. And, um, what does he do? What does he do in his yeah. training when he's seven okay, weeks well, before Okay, well then tell us then. Tell us. I'm not going to tell thing. you much. I'm not going to tell you much. I'm oh, going to let you go read the what? article. Okay. Uh, but I will tell you this. So Suspense. in, in, in total, I think when I look at something like that, I think, okay, for most of us, we have to be far more careful about the balance of volume and like quality volume and intensity because doing too much intensity counterbalances yeah. the volumes that we're trying to accomplish. Um, and so when you look at something like his plan here, he does the Michigan workout, which is always a big favorite of distance runners who are familiar with the Michigan workout. Um, no, it's not because it's like the state of Michigan. Everyone knows about the Michigan workout who's privy to it because it's, it's uh, Ron Warhurst of University of Michigan who created it. And when he did, um, it's based around tempos and interval stuff on the track, like back and forth between them. Great, very difficult, high intensity workout. And so it begs the question, if you're doing something like that, how well are you managing your effort? Yeah. So that's one example. He also does a progressive tempo at some point. It's kind of a progressive tempo. Read the details and you'll notice it's like a staged run, a couple stages of tempo running, which is good stuff. Uh, Pretty short, pretty concise workout. And then he does a fast finish long run in the process too. And I have a bittersweet relationship with fast finish long runs because too many runners harm their training with those runs. Now that's not to suggest you shouldn't do them ever. Right. And and when we read other athletes, any other athlete, pro runners, your best friend who's also training and doing something different than you, it is so important to think about what your needs are and what's going to mm. get you most fit for race day. So for me, I need to be more conservative than some of the, my other Especially friends. Especially on long runs. Yep. And so it is important to think about what you need and not compare what you're doing. Don't don't just go and read what Jared Ward is doing and do that. He <laughs> wouldn't even tell you to do that. He coaches other runners. He's not telling them to do the exact same thing as him. Nope. He's a professional. He's been doing this for how many years, Zach? Probably 20. <laughs> Always interesting Yeah. to see. And, 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 and the takeaways involved with that. So um, good reflection. Oh, you know, Go and check out the article to see the details and his own reflection on them. He talks about it in a couple instances where he feels like he overdid it a bit on one run or another. But then you notice on his easy runs. And so here's a marathoner who's run like 209 and change. Um, and, and at the same time, he's running easy runs at plus seven minute pace. Okay. So good to know. Yeah, it's good. Good reflection. Yeah. Okay. Well, that wraps up our top three of the world of running, some latest articles and news. You can expect that to be our format as we continue to move forward and certainly uh, give us the feedback. You know, we'd love to know what are some things you want us to cover with the world of running? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we do race results. Sometimes we do articles we find interesting, but we're always curious if you stumble upon something yourself or if you've got ideas, Mm -hmm. share it, post in the comments, post on social media, let us know. Yeah, we'd love to hear. And thank you so much for joining us for this episode with Natasha Rogers. We're very thankful to get great guests. It's just awesome to connect with you in the running community and bring these stories, this expertise to you. So thank you so much for joining us. And with that, the last thing and always the first thing you need to do whenever you're thinking about running and your running needs is to head to a to z running.com and look for the word coaching. <laughs> nice plug, Zach. Because just in case there's an opportunity for us to support your needs, that's the place you start. 